Calvary's blood. Page number 253 in your psalm books tonight. Page number 253. Good to see all of you out this evening. Page number 253. Page number 253. I carried a burden, a staggering weight, and struggled for freedom but could not escape. I trembled and cried at the thought of my fate. What must I do to be saved? Desperately searched for release from my pain, but found that man's wisdom was useless and vain. Is there not a power that can break every chain? What must I do to be saved? Jesus' blood flows from Calvary. Break, he saved his power, said he cast. Number 412, How Can I Fear When Jesus Is Near? Page number 412. Page number 412. That's all right. Let's try that again, please. When shadows fall and the night covers all, there are things that my eyes cannot see. Savior is near, my Lord abides with me. How can I fear? Jesus is near. He ever watches over me. Worries all cease. He gives me peace. How can I fear with Jesus? When I'm alone and I face the Stand tonight. We'll open the service and prayer tonight.
Brother Terry, would you lead us in prayer tonight, please? Father, we are thankful, Lord, for the blood you shed for us in Calvary. Amen. Yes. Lord, yes. we thank you, God, that you've given us so much, Lord. And what blessings, Lord, you bestowed upon us. Lord, we pray that you be in the service tonight. Help Brother Danny, Lord, we pray you put your anointing power upon him yes. as he brings forth the word. And be with all the sick and afflicted tonight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome someone you don't know. Turn to page number 295, Wonderful Words of Life. Page number 295. Page number 295. Page number 295. Sing them over again to me.
blessed one gives to all wonderful words of love. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of love. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of love. Thank you tonight. And I say I appreciate Brother Danny. Amen. I tell you what, uh, he's just been a blessing to me at this church. Good to see everybody out tonight. Uh, just in case you didn't know, there's lots of folks sick. And uh, so you just well to get it and get over it. <laughs> get through it, amen. And uh, just uh, uh, there were people driving to church today and got sick in their car and had to turn around and go home. And I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's, it, it's out there. But I uh, hope you'll get through it. Uh, drink you enough, um, uh, what's that stuff, that moonshine? Drink, get you enough moonshine. It'll either knock you out or get you well, one or the other. Amen? I shouldn't have said that. Should. That's terrible. I appreciate it. Tell you, drink moonshine. That's just terrible. That, anyway, you know, we'll say that, but we'll drink NyQuil. Yeah. That's Liberty Faith liquor, in case you didn't know. NyQuil is Liberty Faith. That's ours. That's, we drink NyQuil. We don't drink. We drink NyQuil. Danny, come preach before I get myself in trouble amen. amen i do appreciate danny he's been such an encouragement to me in these this set last always been encouragement to me, especially in the last few years danny pray for him while he preach amen what you do give him an amen every once in a while even if it makes you mad just help him preach <laughs> turn your bibles if you will to second timothy chapter three second timothy chapter three i put on facebook this morning that i was going to preach on how i know the bible is the word of god how I know the Bible is the Word of God. You need to get that settled in your heart here tonight if you haven't done that already. That this Bible that I hold and hopefully the Bible that you have in your lap or in your hands is the Word of God. We're going to go through a lot of scripture tonight. And so you can just kind of bear with me and might want to write some of it down so you won't forget it. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 14. Paul wrote to Timothy, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and for profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Then chapter 4 and verse 1 says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. He told Timothy, he said, number one, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they have heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Let's stand tonight as we go to God in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity and privilege of taking the word of God once again and rightly dividing the word of truth. We're thankful, God, for the scripture that you leave us, God. We're thankful for the message that we heard this morning. We're thankful, God, that you're our intercessor, that you're our high priest, Lord, because, Lord, I need you to intercede for me. I'm just no sinner saved by the grace of God. And, Lord, I need you every time I pray. Lord, we're thankful for this service tonight. Thankful for those that's listening online. We're thankful for those that are here in the congregation tonight. Those that are sick, I pray, Lord, that you'd touch them and heal their bodies soon. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, try that. That better? 
They're shaking their head like that. So, I, All right. I read the scripture there, how I know the Bible is the word of God. The major division between professing Christians today, I think, is no longer a denomination. Now, we could talk about them all day long and all night long. Uh, and there's some as denominations, some are denominations. And so there's a difference there, okay? But I, wanna, I believe that the division is between those who believe the Bible is true tonight and those who do not believe the Word of God is true. Now, I believe that it's true. Our passage of Scripture predicted this would happen, but that those who believe the Bible to be the inspired Word of God would become fewer in number and would be looked down upon. And we live in that day and time today. If you believe that you uh, have the Bible in your hand, the King James Authorized Version Bible, you're probably in the minority today as far as this world's concerned, as far as America's concerned. But I, I still believe it's the Word of God. I don't believe it because Daddy and Mommy told me or some preacher told me years ago that we had as a pastor. But I believe it because I find that in the Word of God. Now, I want to say without stuttering or stammering that everything we do here at this church is built upon the fact that this is the very Word of God. Amen. And without the assurance of that, I mean that every word is true. We have no certainty about the way of salvation. We have no promise of a home in heaven. And we have no standard in which you and I need to live by. And we must have that standard, okay? If a church doesn't believe that the Bible is the word of God, then it may get nothing more than a social club dedicated to the betterment of the community, always trying to make the world a better place to go to hell from. I'm glad I have assurance of salvation tonight. I'm glad I know in whom I believed, as Paul said. I'm glad I know I trusted in Christ. And Brother Jim, I put my faith in him and him alone. Nobody else. I was kind of like Pastor Reg here. I grew up in the church that they had one preacher come in. He believed eternal security. Next to come in, he believed you could be lost. And next to come in, he believed this and that and something else. By the time I, I, I was grown, I was so confused. I didn't know where I was at or what I was doing. But the thing that straightened me out was getting in the Word of God. Amen. Studying the Word of God. I want to encourage you to do that today. I believe if a church doesn't believe the Bible, that it's nothing but a, a social club, dedicated to the community maybe, doing good works, don't misunderstand me, doing good works, feeding people and so forth and so on, uh, but still, it's not a church. We need to recommit ourselves tonight to being more than just a social club or a civic organization. We must recommit ourselves to being a soul-winning, life-changing, Bible-believing church, and our final authority isn't some headquarters somewhere. Our final authority is not a committee somewhere. Our final authority is not some deacon board somewhere, even the pastor. Our final authority is the inerrant, infallible, God-breathed book called the Holy Bible. So we need to know if it's accurate and dependable, and it is. But I want to show you some things tonight from the Word of God. Now, that's why we read this passage tonight, because it contains some great truths which will help us lay a foundation. I've had people come to me in years gone by, and ask the question, what does it matter if this is the Word of God? You know, what difference does it make? Or who cares if it's true? Well, I care if it's true. <laughs> I'm basing my eternity on this Word. I'm basing my home in heaven on this Word. He said, if I go away, I'll, I'll go to prepare a place for you and come back and receive unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And so I want to look at the God's Word tonight and see what it says. Now the Scriptures, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, are inspired. Notice what it says there. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I like that. Now the word inspiration actually means God breathed. Now I'm, I'm using my breath tonight to bring the words out to you. And, and as, I, as a, my air comes out to bring the words out to you, my breath passes through my larynx, out of my throat, articulated by my tongue and lips, and it all starts with the breath. This Bible all started with the breath of Almighty God. It didn't start with some man thinking, well, this sounds pretty cute, and I'll write it down. And, or some man, somebody else says, well, this sounds good, and I'll write that down. It started with the breath of God according to what the Bible says. It all starts with breath. If a trumpet blows, it makes a certain sound. Now, the person that blew the trumpet can go blow a different instrument, like a, a, a tuba or a trombone. It would make an entirely different sound. In the same way, God breathed his, his, his words into 40 different men through the ages. And while they sound out in different tones, they all originated with the same source, and that's the breath of God. We're talking about inspiration. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse number 16 we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we have made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are witnesses of his majesty. 
pre-received from God, from God the Father, honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, whom I will please, and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We also have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in the dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now that tells us that the Word of God is inspired. We're talking about inspiration right now. And we're not talking about partial inspiration. I've heard people say, well, part of it's inspired and part of it's not inspired. Well, please tell me what part's inspired. Try, try to figure out which part is not inspired. If you can figure that out and convince me, then you've done a pretty good job. It's not partial inspiration. It's all scripture, the Bible says. A lot of people think that Genesis and Job and scripture like that are not inspired. There's, they're all, all inspired. Every word in the Old Testament and New Testament is inspired by the word of God. We're not talking about progressive revelation. I mean, Job and Genesis are just as much exp uh, inspired as, as revelation is. And so you're, you're not talking about partial inspiration or progressive revelation. We believe in the verbal plenary inspiration, which means the very words are inspired, not just the concept or thoughts. Right. You cannot have thoughts without words any more than you can have music without notes and mathematics without numbers. Jesus said this. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then he also said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, one time I looked up what a jot and a tittle was. It's the smallest part of the Hebrew language. So in essence, Jesus was saying this. There won't be a comma left out. There won't be a period left out. There won't be an exclamation point left out. There won't, the T's all be dotted and the I's all, T's all be crossed, the I's all be dotted. That sounds good to me. And so we see inspiration. But the scriptures not only inspired, they're instructive. Notice there in, in uh, chapter 3 and verse 16 again, they show us what is right. The Bible says there, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable, notice what it says, profitable for doctrine. Now, I remember a man coming to me one time after I preached in the church for a while. He said, I don't want to hear any doctrine. I said, you must be sick. He was talking about the doctrine of the Bible. I was referring to physical sickness. Listen, doctrine is teaching. The pastor got up here this morning and showed you a picture of the great high priest. He began to teach on that great high priest. Now, he said it was boring, and, you know, anything can be boring, okay? I can be boring, you can be boring. Anything can be boring. But what he was doing was teaching you from the Word of God who the high priest was and the office of the high priest, what he did. And as I looked at that this morning, as he was teaching that, I thought, the Bible is profitable for teaching. It's profitable for doctrine. There must be an absolute truth. There has to be a final authority saying that this is right and that's wrong. Preachers used to stand by and say, the Bible says. It's been a few years since you've probably heard that. And now they say the church believes. And they're getting to say, well, it seems to me, you know, hey, it don't matter what I think. Opinions are kind of like armpits. Everybody's got two of them and they usually stink. So don't take my opinion on anything. You go to the word of God and you look at what God says about anything, about salvation. Salvation is by the blood. No other way. If you read the Bible, it's by the blood of sacrifice. And I could go on and on on that. But, uh, you know, my opinion is worthless. Scripture shows us what's wrong. Verse 16 says, for reproof. We need to be reproved once in a while. You say, I don't do anything wrong. Well, you just lied. You, you just told a big, big fat lie right there, okay? And then how to get it right for correction. If you're on the wrong path, the Bible will set you straight and put your feet back on the course. And then it shows us how to stay right for instruction in righteousness. And so these are things that we need to get in our, in our mind, okay? I want to know what God has to say. I want to know what he has to teach us. The scripture are instrumental for salvation. Verse number 15, notice that. 
It says that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The Scriptures are instrumental for people being saved. No one's ever saved apart from the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Even the thief on the cross took God at His Word. Took the Word of Jesus as being true, and He was saved. In verse 17, it talks about sanctification. Notice there, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The phrase may be perfect means to be mature. Sanctified, become mature. When you get saved, you're just a babe in Christ. Uh, when I got saved, I didn't know anything about being saved. I knew I was a sinner. I knew Jesus was a Savior. I knew that I uh, headed for hell. I knew I needed His salvation. Amen. And so I called upon His name and He saved me that Sunday night. Then it talks about service. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We're not saved by works. But we're saved by serving. We're saved at, we serve after we're saved, okay? Now notice something else. Your usefulness is tied to the Scripture. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Studies to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God wants us to rightly divide the Scriptures. So the Scriptures are, number one, inspired. Number two, they're instructive. Number three, they're instrumental. Most people don't realize that there's today a major battle for the Bible going on right now. But we're in a war in the world today over the Bible, whether it's the inerrant, infallible Word of God, and you better know what you believe and why you believe it. We live in a day in which everything that is not nailed down is coming loose, and the devil is pulling the nails as fast as he possibly can. And if your heart tonight, you haven't got this book nailed down in your heart as being the Word of God, you need to nail it down here this evening. You need to nail it down tight. Some despise God's Word. Others deny God's Word. They say, I don't believe it. Others distort God's Word. They twist it to say what they want it to say. Others dissect God's Word. They cut the parts out they don't like. Others disregard God's Word. They say it's irrelevant and important in this day and time. Even churches have replaced theology with meology. The worship of me. You see that all over the country. The worship of me. Despite, don't despise it. Don't deny it. Don't distort it. Don't dissect it. Don't disregard it. But delight in it and defend the Word of God. The late Robert, Robert G. Lee said this. He said, The Bible is a book above and beyond all other books. As a river is beyond a rivulet, as the sun is beyond a candle in brightness, as the wings of an eagle above the wings of a sparrow in strength, it is supernatural in origin, eternal in duration, inexpressible in value, immeasurable in influence, infinite in scope, divine in authorship, human in penmanship, regenerative in power, infallible in authority, universal in interest, personal application, and inspired in totality. The Bible is a book that has walked more paths, traveled more highways, knocked on more doors, spoken to more people in their mother tongue than any other book that's ever known or ever will be known. That evidence demands a verdict. I'm glad my faith is not in a fable. I'm glad my faith is rooted in fact and truth. Believing the Bible isn't leaping into the darkness, it's to step into the light. I'm glad I've stepped into the light. So here's some evidence to write down and give you out as, as you have the opportunity to. We're going to look at some things. The miracle of the origination of the Bible. Really, the Bible is 66 books in all. It's a library within itself. I mean, you can take it, you can read it, all the way from Genesis to the book of Revelation. These 66 books are written over a period of 1,600 years, written by 40 different men from 13 different countries and three different continents. And yet it all comes together as a literary masterpiece with one central theme or without contradiction. That's the miracle that a divine author oversees the whole thing. God oversaw the whole thing. These 40 men came from a variety of backgrounds. Doctors, fishermen, shepherds, soldiers, kings, princes. Some are rich, some are poor, some are educated, some are uneducated. If I was to take 40 men from this congregation here tonight, probably the 40 of them wouldn't agree on hardly any one thing, much less everything. Right. And these men have agreed on everything that they wrote about the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of them just wrote, and you see the picture of Christ. Uh, and others wrote about Jesus himself because they were with him. But you can find Jesus on every page of this book. The Bible covers a variety of subjects. The origin of the universe, creation of man, beginning of sin, divine principles of government, rise in history of Israel, incarnation of Christ, institution of the church, evangelization of the world. Yet with all this variety, with all these colors making its light, with a thousand threads weaving its tapestry, there's one thing from beginning to end, Jesus Christ and the redemption of mankind. I'm thankful for that. 
Uh, I could go through all the books of the scripture, but I won't do that. But Genesis, you see the seed of the woman there in Genesis 3 and verse 15. In Exodus, the Passover lamb, Leviticus, the high priest, Numbers, a pillar of cloud by day and far by night. We go on and on and on with each of the books of the Bible, and it shows you a picture of Jesus Christ. Needless to say, this book is nothing short of a miracle. The miracle of its preservation, no less amazing than the Bible's origination, is its preservation. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, the word of God says. The Bible is not the book of the month. It's the book of the ages. Think about that. The book of the ages. No book has ever been the object of more attacks, more hatred, and more scorn than the word of God. No book has ever been despised and rejected like the Word of God. It's been burned. It's been ridiculed. It's been outlawed. But amazingly, the more it is attacked, the more it multiplies. Voluntaire said in his day, he was a renowned atheist, and a hundred years the Bible will be a forgotten book, only to be found in museums. One hundred years later, Volunteer was dead. The house was purchased. His house was purchased by the Virginia Geneva Bible Society for the printing and distribution of Bibles. Bob Ingersoll, a well-known atheist of the last century, used to travel a circuit delivering messages on why the Bible is not true. This is what he said. He said, 15 years I have the Bible in the morgue. He died 15 years to the day that he said that. He was in the morgue. But the Bible never did get to the morgue. And the Bible will never get to the morgue. The Bible lives on. Many a man has tried to preach the funeral of the Word of God only to find out the corpse outlives the pallbearers. John Cummings said, the empire of Caesar is gone, but the word of God still survives. The legions of Rome are smoldering in the dust, but the word of God still survives. The avalanches of that Napoleon heap upon Europe have melted away, but the word of God still survives. The pride of the pharaohs have fallen, but the word of God still survives. Tradition has dug for it for a grave. Many of Judas has betrayed it with a kiss. Many of demons have forsaken it, but the Bible still survives. It's a miracle in its origination. It's a miracle in its preservation. It's a miracle in its circulation. No book has ever been circulated like the Bible. I mean, it's been a bestseller for years. Many people have given their lives for the cause of circulating the Word of God. The Gideons are just one organization doing this. Each year, it's said they distribute over 500 million Bibles worldwide. <coughs> people who risk their lives to smuggle the Bible into countries whose leaders forbid its distribution. And some church members don't even carry their Bibles to church. What a shame that is. When we were over in Russia, we'd hand out Bibles wherever we went. I'd see those kids come up there, probably street kids, probably lived down on the street. And you'd hand them a Bible and take that Bible and tuck it under their arm like a football and back through the congregation they'd go. They want nobody to get that Bible from them. Uh, we, don't, we, let come, we go home on Sunday night and we lay it on the counter. It sits there and sits there. You might pick it up Wednesday night if you happen to come to church. Or you might pick it up the next Sunday morning if you have to come to church. But the thing about it is, the Bible ought to be read. It ought to be read constantly. John Wycliffe gave his life for translating the Bible from Latin to English. He'd done it against the wishes of the Pope. By the way, he had spoken out against the Pope that he was not, that he was not infallible. And it cost him quite a bit. After his death, the church actually dug up the bones of John Wycliffe and burned the bones and threw the ashes in the Thames River. You say, what a terrible thing. Well, it's a beautiful picture of what he did for the Bible. For the river carried his ashes to the ocean. The ocean carried his ashes all over the world and everywhere that waves lap against the shore, the word of God has been distributed. <coughs> it's a miracle book in its origination, its preservation, and its circulation. If the Bible is the word of God and we know that it is, then we are obligated to live by the word of God. And though it's widely available, anyone can purchase one anytime they want. It's most effective when hand-delivered in love by you to somebody else. Now, the internal evidence. The Bible reveals scientific facts in a thousand of years before science ever learned about them. <coughs> While it's true that the Bible is not primarily a science book, not just a textbook designed to speak to your mind, but rather a love letter to speak to your heart, we should remember that the God of salvation is the God of creation. And when the Bible does speak on scientific matters, it speaks with complete authority and absolute certainty and accuracy. Every once in a while, you hear about some modern science disagreeing with the Bible. What should we do when this happens? Well, be patient because science has to catch up with the Bible. Science has always need to catch up with the Word of God. Some examples are this. <coughs> as recently as 1600. Second here, I'm going to have to get some water.
You know, I'm kind of having trouble here. There you go. The, uh, as recently as 1600, doctors and scientists still believe that many ailments and diseases were a result of the human body having too much blood. So what, have you ever, ever went by the barber shop and seen the, the pole there, the red and white pole, blue pole? You've seen it? That's not a candy cane. That's where the doctors would send the people to get bled to the barber shop. Now, have you ever been nicked a little bit? And maybe you thought you were going to bleed to death. What? That's why they bled people to death right there. George Washington had been bled twice. The doctor said you need bled again. So they bled him the third time. The third time they got a quart of blood out of him and he died. Now, let me tell you something. <coughs> After that, as time went on, pe people found out in the medical business, the blood, you had to have it to live. Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Blood feeds your body. Takes food to your vessels. And I mean, without the blood, we, we wouldn't be here tonight. We'd all be dead. So doctors would prescribe that you go to the bar to be, barber to be bled. Now, science knows it's a blood that fights diseases, brings nourishment, repairs tissue, promotes growth. If they only read Leviticus 17, 11, they would have known that. In the 14th century, a plague decimated the population in Europe. One in four people died. One, two, three. You di you're dead. You died. One, two, three. You're dead. You died. Can you imagine one in four people died in, in Europe, in England? Well, what happened was, it was a black plague. It wasn't the scientists, the doctors who brought the plague under control. It was the church. The church applied a principle to the situation that was unheard of at the time. But we take it for granted today, and that's quarantine. Leviticus 13, 46 says, All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled, he is unclean, he shall dwell alone, without the camp he shall be his habitation. There it's talking about leprosy. People in Moses' day didn't know anything about microbiology. They didn't know what a germ was, what a virus was, but God gave them the principle of quarantine. In the 1800s, a physician in Vienna was in charge of a hospital there. Pregnant women were coming in and out for routine examinations. Right after the exam, many of them died of infection. And he noticed that the doctors were not washing their hands. They come out of the morgue or come out of somebody else's room, wouldn't wash their hands. And of course, disease began to spread. And he made it a rule the doctors had a fit. We won't be able to see many patients this way. No, but they're going to live. That was what it was all about. This is ridiculous. It'll slow us down. Now the medical field today knows to wash up because only, but science has caught, finally caught up with the Bible in this area. Thousands of years ago, Moses said in Numbers 19, This is the law when a man dieth in a tent, and all that cometh into the tent, and all that is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel which hath no covering bound upon it is unclean. <coughs> and whosoever toucheth, and whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open fields, or a dead body, or a bone of a man, or a grave, shall be unclean seven days. For an unclean person shall take of the ashes of the burnt heifer a, pur <coughs> a purification for sin. <coughs> Running water shall be put thereto into a vessel. And a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water and sprinkle it upon the tent and upon all the vessels and upon the persons that were there and upon him that touched a bone or one slain or one dead or a grave. And the clean person shall sprinkle upon the, the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day and on the seventh day shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water shall be clean at even. But the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation, because he hath defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation hath not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. Think about that. Now, how did Moses know these things? I mean, Moses was raised in Egypt. Boy, Egypt had some really, really bad things. He knew it simply because all scripture is given by inspiration. So far, we've been looking at the medical field. Let's notice something else here. Egypt was the leader in the medical trade in those days. Let me give you some uh, medical information that the Egyptians left us. 
To prevent the hair from turning gray, you anoint your head with blood of a black cat, boiled in oil, or with the fat of a rattlesnake. <laughs> so I'm too late. Mine's already turning gray. I'm not handling a rattlesnake. <laughs> to prevent the hair from, uh, to prevent baldness, apply a mixture of six fats, namely those of a snake, to strengthen it, anoint it with the tooth of a donkey, crushed in honey. Now, I'm looking around here, and I see some bald-headed men. You tell me how that works for you next week, okay? If you come in here next Sunday morning with a head full of hair, we're going to know it worked. How stupid is this, folks? Huh? How stupid is it? Another cure, you can soak your head in persimmon juice. It won't grow your hair, but it'll shrink your head to fit the hair you have. <laughs> that makes about as much sense as, as the ones that the Egyptians used. <laughs> Other remedies include donkey's dung, lizard's blood, swine's teeth, rotten meat, moisture from pig's ears, fly excretion, which would be hard to collect. <laughs> now, Moses was educated in these schools. Aren't you glad he didn't come out with some of this? You know, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad the dietary code and sanitary code was the code that Moses wrote down, not something that they would write down. Astronomy, we take for granted that the earth is spent in space, hanging from nothing. Pastor mentioned something today, the flat earth theory. Now, Job said in the oldest of biblical writings, Job 26, verse 7, he stretches out, his, he stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Yeah. What does that tell you? It knocks the flat earth theory right out of the ballpark. That was a radical thought until a few hundred years ago. Columbus, you're going to sail off the end of the earth. I bet he heard that a million times before he left. But 700 years before Christ, Isaiah said that God setteth upon the circle of the earth. It means the globe or the spear of the earth. Again, that no flat earth theory around here. We had some folks want to get their kids in school. And the first thing they said, we believe in the flat earth theory. I looked at Ramona and I just shook my head. I thought, it ain't happening. We ain't having that come in here. Amen. We ain't having it shared. I don't want them to share it with one person. Amen. Not any. In 150 BC, there was an astronomer laid down the pencil down, said it's done. He believed he'd count all the stars in the sky, 1,022. <laughs> that number was used in universities, now listen, for 250 years. Then another man come along and laughed. He said, 1,022, that's ridiculous. There's 1,026. He had found four more. That was science for 1,300 years. And Galileo came along with his invention, the first crude telescope. He looked at it for the first time and said, we know there's billions and billions of stars in each of these galaxies, which are innumerable. What did the Bible say about that long before they were born? <coughs> Jeremiah 33, 22, as the host of heaven got be numbered, God said to Abraham, your seed will be innumerable. And then he used the illustration, like the stars of heaven. Like the stars of heaven. Scientists always need to catch up with the Bible. Science is not the only witness called to the stand. There's a witness of history. This is not a history book, but it's historically correct. Historians have always needed to catch up with the Bible. The Bible records that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Jesus verified it in the New Testament. For many years, unbelieving historians laughed at the thought that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. That's impossible, they said, for there was no written language while Moses lived. In 1887, in north, northern Egypt, 300 clay tablets were unearthed. We know them as the Tel El Armana tablets. What were they? They were letters and business transactions between Egypt and Palestine dated centuries before Moses was even born. Not, not only did it prove that they had a written language, they had a postal service. Hopefully a little better than the one we have today. <laughs> Remember the story in the book of Daniel, Belshazzar seeing the handwriting on the wall. For centuries, the story mocked that story as mythology. Since they have the Babylonian records, which show the last king of Babylon, not Belshazzar, but Nabonidus. As a matter of the, a fact, they say we have no record anywhere that any time Belshazzar ever lived. One clay tablet was found by archaeologists which revealed the truth. Nabonidus was the father of Belshazzar, and they were co-regents. Otherwise, they ruled together. Nabonidus traveled the world. His son ruled the kingdom. Now we have a better understanding of Daniel 5 and verse 16. The last part of verse 16 simply says, Now shalt be third ruler in the kingdom. Nabonidus was first. Belshazzar was second. And then Daniel became the third ruler in the kingdom. If that tablet had never been found, 
Would we doubt the Bible? I wouldn't have doubted it. Because I believe the Bible is true. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, Sir William Ramsey was a well-known archaeologist and historian. He considered to be the most eminent scholar on Asia Minor and its geography and history. He read the book of Acts and said, It's a highly imaginative and carefully colored account of primitive Christianity. He said, I have no respect for Luke as a historian. So he decided to go to the Middle East. So he went to the Middle East for the express of proving the Bible wrong in its history. He came home and wrote the book, Luke, the Beloved Physician, which he proclaimed Dr. Luke to be one of the world's foremost historians. He said, I take the view that Luke's history is unsurpassed in his trustworthiness. You may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historian. They will stand the keenest scrutiny and the harshest treatment. How about prophecy accuracy? I just want to take a few of those. Well, 300 direct prophecies in question about Christ. Isaiah 7, 14, he was born of a virgin. That happened in Luke chapter 1, verse 7. Micah 5, and verse 2, he was born in Bethlehem. That happened in Luke 2, verse 4. <clears throat> Genesis 49, 10, born of the tribe of Judah. It happened in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3. Psalm 78, verse 2, he said he would speak in parables. He did that in Matthew 13, 34. <clears throat> Zechariah 9, 9 said he rode a colt of a donkey. That happened in Matthew chapter 21. Isaiah 61 said he would heal the brokenhearted. He did that in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. In Isaiah 53 and verse 3, he was rejected by his own. And the Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 11, that happened. <coughs> in Isaiah 53 and verse 7, he would stand silent before his accusers. Mark 15, 5, that happened. Psalm 22, we haven't read that for a while. You need to go back and read it. Cast lots for his robe. That happened in John chapter 19, verse 23. Psalm 22, 100 years before the crucifixion ever invented or thought of, prophets said that he would, and they would pierce his hands and feet, and it happened. Psalm 22, verse 1 starts with this, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said the same thing in Matthew 27, verse 46. In verse 5 of Psalm 22, he said his tongue, his tongue claved to his jaw. That happened in Matthew 26, verse 15. Zechariah 11 and verse 2, sold by his enemies for 30 pieces of silver. That happened in Matthew 26, 15. Isaiah 53, 9, buried with the rich. That happened in Matthew 27. One skeptic now said, certainly this is the most striking coincidence of details. I want to tell you it's more than a coincidence. It's evidence that demands a verdict. And the problem, Mr. Skeptic and Mr. Infidel and lost person, is if you love your sin and the Bible's true, you're condemned to a devil's hell. Just that simple. The Bible and its, its salvation to the sinner, sanctification to the saint, sufficient to the suffering, satisfying to the scholar. It's so deep the scholar can swim in it for a lifetime without ever touching the bottom. Yet so simple a child can approach it for a drink without ever fear of drowning. I love its depth. The greatest truth I ever learned from the Bible is this. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. I'm glad... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm thankful for other scriptures there. For God commendeth his love towards them. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. A lot of scriptures on the love of God. I'm thankful for the word of God. It's brought me from darkness into light. It's been a comfort to me on many a long, lonely night. In the past couple of years. God's been good. God's been good to me. I love him. I appreciate his presence. I appreciate the Holy Spirit that spoke to these men that wrote down and penned the word of God. Without it, folks, we'd be all lost. We had no hope. Let's stand tonight, if you will. I have a word of prayer, and I'll turn the service to the pastor. He can do what he wants to then. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the message tonight. I don't know how good I've presented it. I know I've been having throat trouble for weeks now, but God, I, I tried the best I could. Amen. And God, I just pray you'd take it, and where I failed as man to deliver it, that you'd take it and just anoint it with the sweet Holy Ghost of God. And Lord, just use it, God. Do whatever you can with it. Lord, I'm thankful for your Bible. Thankful for your word. Thankful for this church. Thankful for their pastor. He means so much to me. He's more than just a cousin. He's a man of God, and he's a man that preaches the word. If he didn't, I wouldn't be here. 
God, I'm thankful for him. Touch people's hearts tonight. Those that are listening online, maybe somebody needs to be saved. We pray they'd find a place and in their home or in their car or wherever they're at. Maybe somebody here needs to be saved tonight. I pray, God, that they call out to you and accept you as their personal Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Boy, I tell you, I'm glad I was here. Boy, what a good message, wonderful message on the Word of God. I need that every once in a while. Amen. <clears throat> you understand why I appreciate Danny? Just solid, solid. Well, Danny, I appreciate that. I, I want to get that one deal you said. I'll get with you later on. If you're here tonight and you not sure about your soul, I'm going to be here for a while. I'm going to dismiss it just a minute. But if you say yes and I want to be saved, I'll be around. Not that you got to have me, but you're always welcome to come and seek the Lord. One thing I'm going to say before we dismiss tonight is that the Mexico sign up, Mexico mission trip sign up sheet is back here on the table. And Brother Helfrich needs you to get signed up and settled on this thing so they can arrange and make plans to go and so forth and know who's all going. So get locked down. I know many of you have been thinking about it, but get locked down as to whether you're going or not and let him know. But do sign up on the sheet back there. And if you have any questions about it, get a hold of them about that. All right. But aren't you glad tonight that we have an anchor for our soul? The word of God that uh, <clears throat> heaven and earth will pass away and his word will not pass away. I appreciate the message tonight. I appreciate getting fed. I need to be fed. Lord, we thank you again for this service tonight. And I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that's not saved and, Lord, they're concerned about their soul. God, that you'd just help them and give them grace right now to break loose from the chains of Satan. And, Lord, come to Christ and come to the cross and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Or those online, I pray, God, as people listen. God, you've opened doors of ministry to us. God, we pray the Holy Spirit of the Lord would take the word of God and travel over the, the ways of Lord if people can hear the word of God. And I pray that bring forth fruit. God, help us this week. I pray, Lord, for the sicknesses in so many families. And I pray that you'll touch them and help them and strengthen us all. And I pray, God, this week that we'll just simply walk with you, Lord, in just honest, uh, consistent walk. And Lord, that we'll just love you and walk with you, Lord, and that you'll fill us with your love and your joy and your peace and we'll bear the fruit of the Spirit. And Lord, help us to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And Lord, the last thing, help us to be awake and sensitive and alert to those that we're around, that we might be a witness to them, Lord, and point them to the Lamb of God. In Jesus' name, amen. You're